Welcome back, press fans. Coming to you from Altman Studios in downtown Brentwood to your ears wherever you are. This is Clocked In with the Press. I'm Jacob Menez, here with me today on sports. You know him, you love him, you want more of him. It's Kyle Szymanski. Hello. Today we've got art galleries, rent hike rallies, and some shakeups in Brentwood's local government. But before all that, here's a word from today's sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by our friends at Sip and Scoop in downtown Brentwood. Sip and Scoop delivers smiles for miles, sip by sip, and scoop by scoop. Gelato, Italian ice, and signature coffee beverages are just a few of the delicious treats on their menu. Stop by Sip and Scoop at 234 Oak Street in downtown Brentwood to get your fix. They're also on DoorDash. Thanks again to this week's sponsor. Let's get back into it with the story out of Byron. Crystal Castaneda starts her new job this week as the new superintendent of the Byron Union School District after the Byron Governing Board voted unanimously on June 23rd to approve her appointment. Castaneda previously served as the principal of Las Juntas Elementary School, a small Title I school in Martinez, for over seven years as she rose from the staff to become their leader. Before we ask Kyle, Title I is a federal education program that supports low-income students throughout the nation. Funds are distributed to high-poverty schools as determined by the number of students who qualify for free or reduced lunch. The funds can be used to hire additional teachers or teaching assistants, to provide computers or software, to fund before, after, and summer school programs, and to purchase additional materials or equipment. Castaneda led the school to higher levels of excellence and was ultimately recognized as a gold ribbon school. The school was also recognized for its work with GLAD, Guided Language Acquisition Design, a program that supports English learners and struggling students. She has been recognized as the Educator of the Year as well as the GLAD Administrator of the Year. Castaneda left Martinez to become the Director of Educational Services in Oakley. During her tenure there, she and the Contra Costa County Office of Education obtained a $5 million literacy grant. She provided district-wide multi-tiered systems of support training and provided support for social and emotional learning and the positive behavioral intervention and support system. Most recently, Castaneda served as the superintendent slash principal in a small rural school district in Contra Costa County called Canyon. You know, Jake, I think this is a wonderful thing for Byron. I know that they are, they've been searching for a superintendent for quite some time. And, uh, you know, Castaneda comes in with experience both at the, as a principal and in East County, right? So she worked for the Oakley School District before this. I think it's going to be a seamless transition for Byron. So I'm excited for the school year and to get her rolling. Well, I think an important thing to remember, you know, as part of her, as far as her background for this position is she's a national board certified teacher, which is, you know, an award that reflects excellence in the profession. There's only 112,000 people nationwide that have received that recognition. The district's previous superintendent, Ray is gone and departed from his role this summer. So, you know, he had been part of the district since July of 2019, and when he replaced a former superintendent, Debbie Gold, and he started to work as a superintendent of the Patterson Pass Joint Unified School District, a comprehensive kindergarten through 12th grade district in Patterson Pass on July 1st. And Ghana, if you remember, Jake departed because he said he missed the high school component of the job, and Byron does not have a high school, obviously. The kids head to Brentwood. So, uh, well wishes to raise Ghana and well wishes to Krista Castaneda when she gets rolling. Sticking with Byron, uh, one person died and four others were hospitalized following a head-on crash on Byron Highway near Mountain Pass Road early on July 1st, according to the California Highway Patrol. A Chevrolet Traverse traveling north on Byron Highway and a Lincoln Navigator traveling south collided at about 5.55 a.m., authorities said. The driver of the Chevrolet was pronounced dead on the scene, and the two passengers in that vehicle were transported to a hospital with minor and major injuries. The two occupants of the Lincoln were hospitalized with major injuries. The names of the victims were not immediately released by the California Highway Patrol as they're still investigating the cause of the crash. Anyone who witnessed the crash is asked to call the California Highway Patrol at 925-646-4980. And just condolences to everyone involved because that's obviously another tough incident here in East County. Moving on to Oakley, the Oakley Police Department is mourning the death of Coda, the department's first canine dog. Coda passed away recently from stomach cancer. He was retired and lived at home with his former handler's family. Coda's handler was Oakley police officer Joshua Del Prado. The pair first worked together in El Cerrito in 2012 and were both transferred to Oakley in 2017. He retired in 2020. Coda was unique, said Lieutenant Robert Roberts, who runs Oakley's police dog unit. Not a lot of officers get the chance to work with the same dog at two different agencies. Coda was able to retire out of El Cerrito, and Officer Del Prado paid a dollar for him, and the city of Oakley was able to acquire him for a dollar, and Officer Del Prado worked with him for another three years, and then he retired out, said Roberts. Code was well-known in Oakley. Del Prado never turned down an opportunity to showcase the dog's skills, whether it was at school, church, or any other public event. The pair were popular, and the public even went so far as to name a park after Coda. Coda was a certified law enforcement dual-purpose dog for both patrol and narcotics. 
He was instrumental in arresting many criminals and helped locate hidden narcotics on many occasions. He and Del Prado performed in demonstrations all over Contra Costa County. Cota was a German Shepherd born in 2010 in Belgium. He was used as a demonstration dog in Europe before he was sold to El Cerrito, where he was then paired with Del Prado and went through 400 hours of rigorous training to become certified. When he wasn't working, Cota loved long walks and playing with his family. In a press release, the city said, quote, Cota was the city's first canine, and we do not doubt that his legacy will live on. He made a tremendous impact on the community and was a key member of the Oakley PD family and will be missed dearly. We thank canine Cota for his years of dedicated service and send our thoughts to the Del Prado family, end quote. And Jake, for a lot of people here in East County, they have probably seen him perform. You know, as you mentioned, he was always performing at community events. And uh, it's actually a good thing that they named its park after Coda because his legacy will live on. Delta Gallery Community Art Center is kicking off its summer by announcing two new art shows that will be open to the public starting July 8th. These include the Art Guild of the Delta third quarter art show with original artwork by local artists and a special show by the Paint Group, That's an acronym for Promoting Arts, Individuals, and Natural Talents. The third quarter show from the Art Guild of the Delta includes painting, photography, sculpture, ceramics, and jewelry. While the Paint Group Art Show is a collection of artwork showcasing local talent from participants of the Paint Group program, a Brentwood-based Creative Arts Day program for adults with intellectual challenges. Among the works featured are whimsical landscapes and colorful abstract paintings that offer a glimpse into the creative minds, imaginations, and experiences of the Paint Group artists. The group's goal is to help each person reach their highest level of artistic achievement and to encourage personal growth, self-reliance, and self-esteem through the creative process. An artist reception will be held on Saturday, July 16th from 6 to 8 p.m. to introduce this new artwork to the public. And Jake, I remember the Art Guild of the Delta started back in 2013 as a nonprofit to build a network of artists to work together to promote and inspire creative influences amongst themselves and their community. And do you know what they do, Jake? I would love to hear more, Kyle. They promote art and advancement in all areas of the artistic endeavors. They organize the Art Walk, the art fair at the Brentwood Farmers Market, and then that's on the second Saturday of each month. They provide scholarships to art students at local high schools and Los Medanos College, and they provide art classes through the Delta Gallery. And they also, maybe most importantly, provide a means for local artists to display their art. I think that's all terrific. They're really doing some great stuff out there. Did you know that the Delta Gallery... (coughs) Excuse me. Here's one for you, Kyle. Did you know that the Delta Gallery just wrapped its second quarter art show back on July 1st? No, I did not. That show was a selection of original works by local artists also. This one featured the Beauty of California show by the California Watercolor Association. That show had 60 pieces from 40 artists who all shared their favorite aspects of life in California as brought to life in watercolor. Kyle, are you much of an artist? (laughs) You know, no, I'm not. I can barely even draw a stick figure, and that is not an exaggeration. (laughs) <laughs> I, I'm just, if there's one thing I cannot do, it's art. The second thing, manual labor. So don't ask me <laughs> either of those. So we won't see you in the Delta Gallery's fourth quarter show is what I'm hearing? Oh, absolutely not. On that note, what you do know a lot about, though, is sports. How would you take us into it? Jake, the River Otters won their meet this week. They won their first invitational, Liberty High School, remaining unbeaten since 2019. And that event featured five teams with almost 500 swimmers. And that event, of course, was uh, June 25th. And in a quote, the board president, Rick Pierce, said the River Otters were excited to take home first place overall in the inaugural event. And the Otters have grown steadily in recent years. They gained 2,328.5 points to win the trophy with the Tracy Tritons finishing second place with 1,203 points. Third place went to Modesto and fourth place went to the Manteca Dolphins. Fifth place can't leave those out, to the Ripon Sea Lions. The Otters also had eight swimmers win first place in their age and gender brackets. And Jake, of course, the Otters are a recreational swim program that was founded in 2014 in Discovery Bay. But by 2019, it had outgrown the town's small community pool. With a full roster of 275 swimmers, the team now takes up all 15 lanes of the new competition-sized pool built at Brentwood's Liberty High School in 2020. And the team includes families from all over East County. The Otters are part of the Mid-Valley Swim League, along with four teams from Antica, Modesto, Ripon, and Tracy. Congratulations to the Otters. I mean, that's I think that's so impressive. I sink like a stone in a pool. Let's hope you never <laughs> swim near me, because I'm not a very good swimmer either. We have a gamer here in town who recently won a national title. Liberty High School senior Juan Sabarillos took home a $7,000 scholarship after winning a national esports competition for the school's new team. 
18 teams from across the country competed in the recent competition. And Seba Rios competed against a Georgia-based team in the game Madden NFL 2022 on PlayStation 4 in the final round of the national competition to win. He had previously qualified by winning the Pacific Region Championship in which 64 teams from Alaska, Washington, Oregon, California, and Arizona competed. And that's according to Kevin Bowles, Liberty's eSports coach. This is the first year the school's had a competitive eSports team, and previously there had been an eSports club ran by students. Severio said, this is the first time Liberty's ever done anything like this. I just want to thank the school and the coaches for the opportunity. And Jake, I know you're a bit of a gamer. I don't know if you're into Madden, but uh, this is something that you could probably talk a little bit about. Well, actually, I'm the one who spoke to Juan for that article. I spoke to him on the phone. Great kid, really nice, very passionate about what he did, just very thankful to the school. But it's it's interesting to see, you know, this. Not, I'm really not a competitive video game player at all. I'm no good at them. I just have fun. You know, so it's interesting to see this esports thing on the rise. I know even the National Federation of High School Sports got involved to get it recognized as an actual scholastic sport. You know, it's a varsity sport, and now you can be a varsity Madden player, as it turns out. And I think the one thing that Juan had really hit on as well when I spoke to him on the phone was just the convenience of esports compared to there's all that traveling in in live sports. And so for that reason, a lot of sports during the pandemic had been affected by that social distancing guidelines. Whereas esports, that gave them kind of a chance that got their foot in the door because they didn't need to adhere to that so much because you can do it from home. Juan had played against a team in Georgia from his house in Brentwood. <laughs> that is amazing. I did not know that they play from their homes. That's very convenient. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's, I mean, you can play players all over the world without ever getting out of your pajamas. I think that's terrific. <laughs> Absolutely. What's better than that? Playing from your pajamas. All right, let's stick with the youth. The East County Little League Senior Softball All-Stars won the District 4 tournament. The All-Star team beat Richmond 11-7 in the deciding game in a recent best-of-three series to win the District 4 championship, punching its ticket to the NorCal tournament July 9th, that's Saturday, in Martinez. And to view some photos of the team, you can visit thepress.net. Congratulations to the team, as always. Speaking of winning teams... The 2025 Delta Valley baseball team, composed of Heritage and Liberty baseball players, recently won the Casey Yoakum Tournament in Reno, Nevada. The squad went 6-0 in the tournament and currently has a record of 17-0-1. And in a statement, the team said during these six games, each player had a role in generating momentum to make it to that tournament championship game. From a multitude of amazing hits, home runs, steals, defensive plays, and pitching, there was no stopping them in the championship game, and these boys battled, coming from a small deficit to get solid hits, taking care of defense, and pitching that just shut it down at the end. For a team that was newly formed this year, not a bad record of 17-0-1. So keep up the good work, coaches and boys, and that's come straight from the team. And Jake, for those who don't know, this is also a big moment for J.J. Kennard, a local player who plays for the team. He hit his first home run of his career during the tournament. Not only did it bring tears to his eyes, but it brought tears to his dad's eyes, his mom's eyes, and even a couple of spectators who have watched him grow from a small baseball player to a budding star. Last time I went to Reno, Kyle, all I did was lose some money. So to go to Reno and come back with a trophy, you can't beat that. And let's stay on the successful track, should we, Jake? The heritage track team of Juan Maldonado, Moral Ambagno, Jordan Green, and Zachary Carroll, all of Heritage High School, recently won the Emerging Elite Section Boys Sprint Medley at the Nike Outdoor Nationals at Hayward Field at the University of Oregon. The quartet won with a time of 136.58, just ahead of the Connecticut-based Derby High School team, which finished in second with a time of 137.08, and Oregon's Lake Oswago finished third with a time of 137.47. And this was a really unique opportunity for this team because typically these youth runners are used to kind of competing against East County, maybe Northern California teams. But this really brought them to the national level and it proved that we have some really talented athletes and runners here in East County. You already know what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it again. Congratulations to Jordan Maldonado, Mora Lombagno, Jordan Green, and Zachary Carroll for your recent accomplishment, for your recent win. Yeah, and what's even cooler is this took, obviously took place at the University of Oregon campus. So maybe one day we'll see them actually competing for the Ducks. All right, gang, we're going to take another short commercial break, but you're going to want to stick around. When we come back, we'll talk about rent increases in Antioch, hospital grants, and the removal of, of a Brentwood planning commissioner. Don't touch that dial. Today's episode of Clocked In With The Press is brought to you by our friends at Sip & Scoop in downtown Brentwood. Sip & Scoop started out as a food truck. 
serving coffee, hot cocoa, and desserts on the go, but the demand was so high that they had to open a shop at 234 Oak Street. Here at Clocked In, we love Sip and Scoop. They're just a few doors down from our offices, and we're there often enough that they know our names and orders. It's like cheers, but better, because there's dessert. Try their cold brew coffee, or choose a latte or Americano for a classic coffee drink that can't be beat. And we haven't even talked about their breakfast sandwiches and avocado toast. Have I mentioned the root beer flows and the iced lemonades? Those are my personal favorites. <sighs> okay, obviously, I could talk about food all day, but here's the point. You gotta go to Sip and Scoop. Visit them at 234 Oak Street in downtown Brentwood, or have Sip and Scoop brought to you wherever you are by DoorDash. Having an event? Let Sip and Scoop cater it. Give them a call at 925-684-7710 to find out more. And we're back. Thanks again to today's sponsor. Let's dive into some Antioch happenings. Kaiser Antioch and the Antioch Unified School District are benefiting from a state grant to the John Muir Health System. John Muir Health has been awarded a nearly $1.8 million state grant over the next three years to support the health system's Beyond Violence program, an expansion of medical health services in the community it serves. This grant is part of California's Violence Intervention and Prevention, CalVIP, grant program, which provides grants to programs and communities that are disproportionately harmed by violence, particularly group member-involved homicides, shootings, and aggravated assaults. That Beyond Violence program, managed as a partnership between John Muir's Community Health Improvement, Trauma Services, and Social Services Departments, is a hospital-based violence intervention program developed in 2010 to stop violence in local communities. As Contra Costa County's only trauma center, John Muir Health sees a high percentage of the victims of violent crime and repeat patients who are stuck in cyclical violence. The program currently serves people aged 15 to 25 who have experienced intentional injury by gun violence, stabbings, or assault. Since its inception, the program has achieved significant success, with 98% of people participating remaining alive, avoiding arrest, and avoiding re-injury after initially being hospitalized at John Muir as a trauma patient. With this additional funding, the Beyond Violence program can remove the upper age limit of people eligible to participate and expand the reach of support programs in the cities of Richmond and Antioch via a new partnership with Contra Costa Family Justice Center in Antioch and Richmond. This funding will also allow for the expansion of mental health services to Beyond Violence program participants, as well as students in the Antioch Unified School District. And Jamie Elmasu, a director of John Muir's Health Improvement Department, said, The funding comes at a critical time and allows us to expand our Beyond Violence program in partnerships with community organizations. We will continue to empower those affected by violence and aid in the healing of individuals and communities through emotional support and safety net resources. And of course, Beyond Violence marries nonprofits to various areas throughout the county, including centers serving West Contra Costa County, One Day at a Time serving East Contra Costa County, the Center for Human Development serving Central County, and the Fred Finch Youth and Family Services, which provides mental health support, and now Contra Costa Family Justice Center. I think one thing that's very important about it, Kyle, is the Break the Cycle of Violence program that CalVIP does. And, you know, they need all the support they can get because this will help them expand and replicate evidence-based violence reduction initiatives, such as hospital-based violence intervention programs, evidence-based street outreach programs, and focused deterrence strategies. And just really looping back to that goal of theirs to keep these kids, and now that they can go higher, these young adults as well, safe. I've got another story out of Antioch for you, Kyle. About 65 advocates rallied recently to demand safe and affordable housing and an immediate stop to what they call exorbitant rent increases. Low-income tenants at Delta Pines Apartment and Casablanca Apartments, two government-subsidized affordable housing buildings, are facing a potential displacement after the corporate landlord recently raised monthly rents by as much as $500. Organized by East Contra Costa Regional Groups, ECRG, First Five Contra Costa, and the Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment, the protesters gathered just before noon at the Lowe's parking lot nearby, then marched to Delta Pines Apartments while holding signs and chanting. People spoke at the rally about their firsthand experiences with unaffordable rents, fears of eviction, and landlord harassment. Speakers also spoke of data from the survey showing the need for tenant protections for Antioch families. Rochelle Peer, an Antioch resident and member of ECRG, said, quote, The lack of access to stable housing is a threat to our basic humanity. Living in Antioch challenges every parent, no matter where they're from or what their income is, to find a secure and dignified place to raise their family. I live in a corporate-owned building, and I'm paying $1,800 a month for a one-bedroom apartment for me and my son. After rent, there's not enough left over to cover emergency expenses. I've had to get payday loans, which puts me even further in debt. Antioch's housing system is broken, and it prioritizes landlords over local families. End quote. More than four in five renters and homeowners surveyed said they want the city of Antioch to take action to limit annual rent increases, prevent unjust evictions, create pathways to homeownership, and build more affordable housing. For Antioch residents, specifically low-income families of color struggling with unaffordable rents, 
Housing instability is a daily concern. In addition to rent increase and threats of eviction, families face harassment from landlords and property managers. Protesters also said they want strong tenant protections in the housing section of the city's general plan. The housing part, which is updated once every eight years, outlines how the city will meet its housing goals and is an opportunity to address past inequities. The full report is called Antioch Change. Change is an acronym for a community housing assessment of needs, gaps, and equities in Antioch, California. And residents of Delta Pines and Casablanca aren't alone in facing sudden rent increases. A new survey of Antioch residents finds rent hikes and housing instability are widespread across the city. 79% of renters report feeling worried about rental increases, while 68% worried about being able to pay their current rent. Local parent advocates with the ECRG, sponsored by First Five Contra Costa, led the community-based survey of more than 1,000 Antioch residents to understand their housing challenges and needs. That report, Kyle, the one I was mentioning a moment ago, Antioch Change, is a partnership between the ECRG, First Five, and Urban Habitat. And the responses to that survey were gathered back in 2021, and the process was guided by residents as leadership and community-based participatory research principles. So it was, it was a crowdfunded effort, essentially. And key findings in the report include that respondents paid an average of 63% of their monthly income on rent, leaving little money left for food, medicine, childcare, and other basic necessities. 51% of renters reported worrying about eviction, and 64% worried their deposits would not be returned when they moved. Low-income residents of color and families with young children faced the least stable housing, according to that report. They faced higher rent burden, fears of displacement, and habitability concerns. Among renters with young children, 83% worried about rent increases and 75% worried about being able to pay the rent at all. So it's, you know, this report is very eye-opening. It's everybody's feeling the squeeze, but no one more so than these low-income families. I think they're more than right to ask to be seen. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't just start at the local level. It goes all the way up to the state level and maybe even the federal level, and it trickles down. So really, to make changes, I feel like it's going to have to start at the federal level and the state level, and then hopefully it will trickle down to the locals. Arguably, they're going with the opposite effect. Trickle down is iffy on whether or not it works, according to a lot of people. So they're trying to you know, prime the pump, essentially. Start at the grassroots level and grow and raise it up to the federal and state levels. So we'll see what happens. Hopefully, it works out. Our last news story today comes from Brentwood. The Brentwood City Council voted at the June 20th meeting to remove David Dolter from the Planning Commission due primarily to what they considered Dolter's unprofessional behavior, and that his seat would remain vacant until the next appointment cycle in 2023. Jovita Mendoza had been one of the council members to speak at the meeting in favor of Dolter's removal. She cited a lot of examples of behavior that she felt was unprofessional or inappropriate for someone in that role. In one example, a motion had gone back to the planning commission, and he complained that he didn't want to come back to him, Mendoza said. This incident happened back in April 2021. She said it was just one of many examples of him not performing to the council standards. She said it just seemed like he didn't want to do his job. Other examples Mendoza highlighted include something from that very same month, April of 2021, in which Dolter, quote, took it upon himself to redefine what a business park was in a way that she said diminished the importance the city council had put on economic development in those areas. So just thematically, the concern was that his behavior was unprofessional and that he was interfering with plans the city put in place already. Additionally, Dolter had emailed colleagues in the planning commission ahead of a vote on a project and informed them of how he would vote, while also informing them he would tell the project applicant to appeal the decision to the city council if the decision was not in the applicant's favor, as Dolter was in favor of the project, according to Mendoza. In a letter to the city council dated June 9th of this year, Dolter acknowledged that he should have behaved differently during those interactions. He said, quote, To begin, I fully support and understand that I serve at the pleasure of the council, and that I can be removed from the planning commission at any time, for any reason, or for no reason. Additionally, I offer my humblest apologies for an email transgression that occurred approximately 15 months ago. It was bad judgment on my part, and it hasn't occurred since, and won't happen again, Dolter said. He went on to say that training in this area for all commissioners and the council is highly recommended to avoid conflict of open meeting laws, but more importantly, to keep faith with the public. To this point, mention was made of my prior service as a planning commissioner in the town of Moraga, and that somehow I should have known better. This prior service was several decades ago, and the open meeting laws have changed during this time, as have their judicial interpretations. Again, underscoring the need for continuing education, Dolter said. This is a dense story. Sets in Mendoza's side. That's Dolter's side. Vice Mayor Johnny Rodriguez was the sole vote against Dolter's removal in that meeting. Rodriguez acknowledged that Dolter needed to work on his attitude, but did not believe that was grounds for dismissal. Rodriguez said he felt that Dolter brought a different perspective that was good to have around, rather than everybody agreeing all the time on all these issues. However, Mendoza was not the only council member concerned by Dolter's conduct. 
Karen Rary brought up an email sent to the city council by Rod Floor. Rod Floor is a Brentwood resident, and he's a frequent participant in all these city council meetings. Floor had emailed the city council and informed them that Dolter had allegedly called the traffic engineer for the city an idiot on social media. Mayor Joel Bryant, for his part, expressed concern that Dolter, as well as other members of city government, not singling Dolter out, have behaved in ways that do not live up to the standard residents should expect from their civic leaders. In an email to the press, Dolter said that the friction between the Planning Commission and the City Council stemmed from second-guessing and micromanagement of the Commission's decisions from a vocal minority within the Council. He said, quote, I have apologized to my colleagues who have thought my behavior out of bounds. This Commission is a good one, and the citizenry should be pleased, but the City Council is another matter. For her part, Mendoza offered a rebuttal to those comments. She said, Removing a Commissioner is never an easy decision and not something I take lightly. It would be irresponsible to the people of Brentwood if I witnessed something and did not bring it forward. I watch every single meeting, and after witnessing multiple comments made by Mr. Dolter, found it necessary for the future of our city to take the initiative to bring it to the city council to discuss. First and foremost, Kai, before we get into the commentary, one thing I'd like to say, like I said, this is a very dense story. There's a lot of moving parts to it. You know, and for the sake of transparency, we put Mendoza's full statement, as well as Dolter's letter to the council, on the press.net, attached to the article for this, so people can feel free to read those in their entirety and get the bigger picture. You know, and this is, obviously, I'm not going to sit here and take sides. I'm just going to say from a general perspective, I hope that the city city leaders can learn from this and grow from this. And it's an unfortunate incident. You never want to see anybody removed from any sort of commission or, or council or anything. But, you know, some positive can come out of this where I think future future leaders can learn about what, what happened here. And the city can hopefully um, make some adjustments about their training and and how to get people prepared to handle the roles. And to that point about the training, I'd spoken to Tim Ogden, who's a city manager for Brentwood, of course. I didn't reach out to asking, you know, is there a code of conduct for the planning commission that would have that Dolter would have been in direct violation of? And Tim Ogden said there's no written code of conduct, although the one for the city council would apply to them, quote, in concept. Uh, he was unsure if the commissioners were provided copies of that code, though. So maybe going forward, the city would might change their approach in that respect. Well, before we take it home, Jake, we're going to talk about some upcoming events. We have two exciting events for people to attend this weekend. The John Marsh Historic Trust will host a guided hike from 8 to 10 a.m. on July 9th at 21789 Marsh Creek Road in Brentwood. And the run team will host two free runs each week. This week, the first will be held at Oakley's Crockett Park. That's 4150 Richard Way in Oakley on July 9th at 7 a.m. And the following day, they'll be in Antioch at the intersection of Empire Mine Road and Mesa Ridge Drive at 7.30 a.m. And for our readers of the press, don't forget to check out our real estate guide in the B section of this week's newspaper. Stories include the state of the real estate market, tips on how to sell your home, and what to look for in a real estate agent. It's a big section, too. We did, what, 20 pages, I think. It's the same size as the full paper. It sounds like some great events. You know, I was telling you off mic that I don't have a lot of plans this weekend. Now I might have some. And you get a little workout in the process. (laughs) On that note... That's it for today's episode of Clocked In With The Press. We appreciate you taking the time to listen in, and we look forward to speaking with you in future episodes. If you'd like to read more news stories of East Contra Costa County, you can do so on our website, www.thepress.net, or through our Twitter and Instagram at Press Clocked In. Be sure to tune in again next week for some interviews and your news and sports highlights. Contact us with your thoughts on this episode or any other before it by emailing podcasts at brentwoodpress.com. Tune in this Tuesday to hear Melissa talk with Doreen Forlow from the Brentwood Historical Society. Until then, thanks for listening, and we'll speak to you all next time. This is Jake and Kyle clocking out. out. Thanks again to this week's sponsor, Sip and Scoop. Remember that feeling of hearing the ice cream truck coming down the street as a kid? Bring back that feeling by visiting Sip and Scoop. They started out as a truck, too, and now they have a brick-and-mortar shop right here in Brentwood, so you don't have to chase them down the block. Sip and Scoop has all kinds of high-quality desserts to satisfy any sweet tooth. Gelato, root beer floats, and iced coffees are just a few of my favorites. And the whole menu is available to go on DoorDash. Stop by their shop in downtown Brentwood and get your scoop on.